Uh, I'd like to welcome back Mark Martinez to the channel. How are you doing, Mark? Good, Sean. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, it's been almost a year. Pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's been almost a year now since the release of uh, your Dream Big documentary. Um, can you update us on how the film has been received since we last spoke? Yeah, well, it's it's um, the response has been good within the core community. It hasn't spread as wide as I had hoped. Um, and thank you for always mentioning my film and for giving me this form again. And hopefully it gets it gets a bit wider. Um, I was speaking to uh, one, one of my friends in New York and I said, I kind of have a feeling that um, this film in terms of finding an audience is going to be as homemade and as organic as my process was in making the film, because it seems to be, um, I will occasionally get emails from either someone who's seen the film or from someone who hasn't like, Hey, how can I see it? Um, so I kind of almost feel like it's, it's, it's going to be, homegrown the whole way that's just going to be the journey so um but uh you know i'm very appreciative of the response i've gotten because it seems to um have hit home with people that were there at that time or people that read about it and and wanted to be there so um you know it, it's 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 been good yeah the feedback that i've heard and read you know since we last spoke has been very positive so i think you're right it is an organic and just take some time to get out there amidst all the noise of the industry and beyond so yeah. yeah but um bill grant was saying at the beginning of the film he said that if he could have a time machine and take people back to the golden era period he said that they would never want to return do you basically agree with what bill said there it might be an obvious question but how, what are your thoughts on that yeah you know it's it's funny it's it's i'm torn on that because um you know i tell people and i'm horrible with with uh, family archives and photographs because I always move forward. But oddly enough, uh, in reality, when I was given uh, a chance to make a film, the first thing I did was the only thing that seemed to really, really speak to me is something that happened 40 years in my past. So um, there's definitely for me um, – something magical about that time of course at that time i was you know between the ages of 17 to 19 so you know that's a wonderful time but also um you know this world was a different place california was a different place um the bodybuilding industry was a different place it wasn't even thought of as an industry back then um but i i definitely do like another quote that that bill said that was in my movie was you know that the world that I lived in at that time was the best world I ever lived in. And um, I think um, it was so open, you know, guys could come from around the world or around the country and with very little money um, be able to set up stakes, um, even though they were living adjacent because, you know, that little triangle of Los Angeles along the coast between Malibu and Pacific Palisades and Santa Monica, um, even back then was really, really exclusive, but it was still um, inclusive in the sense that there was enough things going on like rent control um, and everything hadn't been Disneyized yet, so to speak. Um, so that, you know, it, 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 it was a niche and Venice was one of those niches too, that um, even though it was close to those areas, uh, once you went further down main street, uh, into Venice, the world kind of changed. And that's where, you know, bohemians live, you know, artists with no money could live or people being relocated from prison into halfway houses could live. And that was kind of the flavor. So, but again, when you're young and, and whatnot, um, you know, it was, it was a magical time, no doubt, no doubt. Every Tuesday, there was all the chicken you could eat, Dinah's restaurant, right off the San Diego freeway, telling Bodybuilders, all you can eat, big, big <laughs> problem. Me and Wally had a eating contest. So we're eating and eating. I could say maybe after 15, it's like, wow, we're still going at it, man. 15 pieces, I'm still going, still going. Now, when you, when you get more, you have to get more sides. Okay, so you have to eat the sides and the chicken. It's like, holy shit, man. Come on, let's keep going. <laughs> I get about 23, 24 pieces. 
I can't. What's wrong, Grant? You can't eat any more chicken, man? Yeah, well, I'm going to keep on. I think he ate 32 pieces of chicken. He could still go. Wow. Hearing the amount of money that they paid for their, res yeah. their rents and stuff back then was really surprising. So I was thinking, oh, I can only be so envious to be able to pick up a place by the I ocean know, for that amount I of know. money. Um, Bill had mentioned um, that he had found a, a rent-controlled two-bedroom apartment above Wilshire. And this was after he had moved from his place in Venice. So Bill said, like in the late 70s, he secured a two-bedroom north of Wilshire for less than $400 a month, which even in 1970 dollars was pretty, pretty darn good. Um, you know, cause today those are going for about 4,000 a month, you know? So, um, he had a pretty good, and he had a roommate, uh, an AAU competitor named Larry Gordon lived with Bill for a time. So they split the rent. Yeah. You know, pretty idyllic. And speaking of that time machine that Bill was talking about, if you could use it and go back and change something about the film in retrospect, what would you change or, or maybe adapt? Well, gosh, you know, um, again, you know, we've always spoken about the budgetary constraints that I had because um, the first thing I think what I would do, although I'm very appreciative of, uh, of my brother and uh, my best friend, Dave, who composed the music for me, and I think it was wonderful and worked, um, part of, I think, the impact of the documentary is being able to secure the licensing of songs that were popular at that time. And when I was editing my film in the rough cut, I had those songs. Um, that's what I was cutting to um, with that in mind. And then once I knew that I wasn't going to be able to come up with the money to to secure funding. So I would say, one, the music. Um, two, um, the, the uh, reenactment I had where um, Bob Dottila, who was the literary agent who guaranteed Charles Gaines and George Butler, he could sell Pumping Iron, the book, to a publishing company. I did that with my son, his friend, and his dad, and one of their other friends on my iPhone because I was going, I had it budgeted with a, a cinematographer in Los Angeles, but um, uh, my life coach slash producer, um, you know, I had already, you know, um, I guess asked for enough and I, and it was just too big of an ask. And I wanted to get that. I wanted to get that shot with actors, even though there was no dialogue in it. Um, I think that would have looked better. So the music, I think the music and the dialogue, and then if I could have gotten those drawings animated that uh, my friend Dave, who also co-wrote the music, he he did those those illustrations, which are wonderful. Um, those would have probably been the three, um, uh, the three things that right off the top I'd want. Interesting because I, I watched the movie, I watched the movie just again last uh -huh. night before this interview because I wanted to kind of get a feel for it again. And I really love the illustrations and the music. Everything comes together really nicely. So it hasn't lost any appeal, even on like my third and fourth watches now. Oh, so yeah. you, you to be congratulated for well, that. So it's got definite rewatchability, which is good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It was Arnold Schwarzenegger sexually interested in Ken Spray? Objection, Your Honor. The attorneys jumped out of their seat. Everybody around, objection! <laughs> Don't answer that question. Well, of course Arnold wasn't. Arnold's attorneys knew that. Paramount Pictures attorneys knew that. What the strategy was. At least what my attorney's strategy was. Maybe he was just asking. <laughs> so Arnold wants, and it could have been just a gratuitous comment, a, you know, flippant comment. He says, Gold's Gym is an outhouse to one of the media, it might have been an us or people, I can't remember, I know it made the national wire somehow, but Gold's Gym is an outhouse. I thought, this guy will stop at nothing. I sued Arnold and his employers, Golf and Western and Paramount Pictures, <laughs> down the line for defamation. <laughs> to let, you know, you had to let your adversary know that enough is enough. Arnold at that time was trying to make of course, his name in the motion picture industry, and he wanted to market himself as the bodybuilding industry, which I can understand. And so Arnold would seem to be behind various initiatives to pull the legs out from under Gold's in the Mr. America contest. Carl said in Dream Big that basically the success of Pumping Iron was dependent upon synchronicity of dominoes falling all in the correct order. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been any pumping iron. 
So we get a sense of that synchronicity in Dream Big, especially with the actions and the history of Ken Sprague. And Joe Weider might have been credited as being the father of bodybuilding, but Ken seemed to me like he was the architect that Joe ended up getting all the credit from and all the profit from, from Ken's choices. So just put simply, why was Ken so pivotal in changing the landscape of competitive bodybuilding? You know, it's, it's funny, Ken and his wife were gone on a three-week vacation. They're going to Britain and Portugal and whatnot. But before they left, we spoke on a Zoom uh, two days ago. And it's funny, um, mm -hmm. Joe Weider came up and he said, he goes, you know, Joe and I had a great symbiotic relationship because um, they would eat dinner at Ken's place most Sundays. Um, and, um, but he said, I supplied a free studio. He goes, one, every time pictures are snapped at gold of all the guys, it was free advertising for the gym that I own. And it was a free study studio for, for Joe. Um, I mean, you know, Joe, it's funny when, when you hear people say, you know, Joe, um, I mean, he did his part, obviously. I mean, he, I mean, he loved bodybuilding and, and, um, and, you know, getting Arnold um, was a huge, uh, huge benefit for Joe. But um, when I've been posed this question before by other people, and I said, well, I go, aside from Ken Sprague, you probably say George Butler and Charles Gaines um, as the, the people that really made bodybuilding explode and get it to the general public. And most people would not even know those names. And they would say, well, why? Why, why Charles Gaines? Um, why George Butler? And I'm like, well, George Butler took the wonderful photographs for the book pumping art and Charles Gaines wrote the book. And Joe Weider brought Arnold to this country in 1969. And even by 1975, Arnold was only known still to basically the bodybuilding world for the most part. That's what Joe Weider could do. He couldn't cross the bridge into the mainstream. And that's what that's why it took someone like a, a, a Charles Gaines, who was a, an award winning author and and, um, and George Butler, who was a documentary filmmaker, as well as, a, you know, a top photographer, um, because they ran in those circles. They ran in those literary circles and those art circles that opened up a whole other audience um, for for Arnold and for bodybuilding. Um, so I would say those guys, you know, um, uh, Ken, Charles, and George. It's hard to explain to people today um, in, uh, you know, the 21st century. And, and you know, like Gold's Gym is, is a 20th century brand, but it was a huge brand in the 20th century. And you've got a world today that probably their first awareness of Gold's Gym was probably maybe like in the 80s or 90s because they heard Arnold worked out there at one time or Slice Stallone um, or all the celebrities wearing the shirts. But what they have to realize is if you went back in time um, in 1971, Gold's Gym was set to close down. Um, it had less than 40 paying members. It wasn't owned by Joe Gold. He sold it the previous year to two gym members there who were actually antique. Well, one was an engineer. One was an antique dealer. Uh, Bud Danitz, the antique dealer. Dave Sachs, um, the engineer. And they tried to make a go of the gym. And they're like, we just can't. We're losing money. We have antiques trapped on a ship in the port of Los Angeles. And we need to sell the gym. And so that's where Ken comes in, who was a gym member and um, had some money. And um, so that's the thing is if 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 Ken doesn't buy golds in late 71, who knows? Does Arnold go back to Vince's? Um, where does Arnold go? I mean, what other high pro would Arnold go train at Bill Pearl's? It, it doesn't seem likely. Um, so that kind of saved bodybuilding though people don't know that and i think the reason ken's confusing to people is that he was written out of history um unless you're a guy my age or older or um or read the magazines at that period of time you would not know that ken sprague owned gold's gym if if you would see all the sloppy 
ill-researched or non-researched stuff that you see pop up on YouTube or on online magazines, even from guys that were editors of like Flex Magazine, who, by the way, never made it to California till they were employed. And 15 to 20 years after the golden age, they were only relaying information fed to them. So um, the thing was, yeah, I mean, if someone today would say, oh, well, Joe Gold owned Gold's Gym. Well, he did from 65 to 70. Um, but the thing with Ken, uh, one, he saved it. Um, and he also, um, because of his connections, he was, um, as people, some people may know from, from other podcasts or not, he was a model, but he also did uh, modeling for the gay community, even though he wasn't gay. Um, he went under the name of Dakota. So um, he developed quite a war chest. He was a, a scholarship track athlete from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, uh, you know, six foot three inch, blonde haired, blue eyed guy, very handsome, very handsome guy um, in demand um, and also very bright. And uh, when he had come out to Los Angeles um, and through his looks, he he had also befriended people in Hollywood like Catherine Hepburn and uh, a famous film director named George Cooker. He had a lot of industry connections. So through that, he, once he had bought the gym, he says, well, this place is famous in the bodybuilding world, which probably at that time, I don't know what the circulation of muscle builder must've been 3000, 5,000, 10,000 copies a month, maybe back in those days, which is nothing. Um, you know, he's like, we're going to promote contests. Uh, I'm going to use the connections I have in the media to get word out to local radio stations, TV stations, which is all there was back in that day. There was no internet, right? So um, hmm. he was able to use that. And, um, you know, with Arnold being there, uh, that helped. That helped greatly because that's what attracted uh, uh, George Butler and Charles Gaines to Golds. Um, to start writing the book, Pumping Iron. I mean, um, I hope I answered your question. I think that's one. I mean, first and foremost, Ken saved gold, um, without a doubt. And again, I still don't know outside of my film um, if anyone has ever championed that at all, you know. Um, that's why I think it's confusing to a lot of people, yeah. you know, Ken Sprague's actual role in amongst the whole history there. Ken mentioned in one of the outtakes that, Arnold tried to pull the legs off out of the Mr. America contest because he wanted the spotlight on himself. Can you expand on that a little bit more, what Ken meant? Because even to me, it's not 100% clear. Yeah, well, that's an, an, another thing that gets that gets um, um, brushed over. And people today don't realize that by 1975, 76, Arnold's relationship with Joe Weider had soured. Um, Arnold's relationship with Ken Sprague had soured. And, and people probably don't realize that even though Arnold was a top bodybuilder in the bodybuilding world in terms of influence and power, Ken Sprague is the owner of Gold's Gym and promoter of contests, probably had about as much power as Arnold did uh, in terms of promoting and whatnot. And Ken said he never was interested in professional bodybuilding. He goes, Arnold perceived me as a threat. He said, but my main concern was amateur bodybuilding and delivering the AAU to Joe Weider, um, you know, which he did. Um, but so um, Arnold, when Education of a Bodybuilder came out, his book and his relationship had soured with Ken Sprague. Um, he had mentioned in the book that, uh, Gold's Gym no longer exists, and it is now called World Gym, and also on uh, television shows and local shows in LA, and it probably aired around the country. The um, shows that are no longer around, um, well, they died, you know, decades ago. But one was the Mike Douglas show, and one was the Merv Griffin show. And when Arnold was on guest on both of those shows, he said that going from Gold's Gym to world gym was like going from an outhouse to a penthouse. And that's when Ken had filed the lawsuit for slander and libel and defamation of, uh, of character. Um, so those are things that people don't know. And um, 
they also don't know that that Arnold last trained at Golds in '76, and I don't think he returned to a Golds until probably maybe five years ago or so, six years ago maybe. He, you know, um, so. But anyway, um, Arnold, who was at that time, I believe, starting to date Maria Shriver um, of the Kennedy family, of the Kennedy Shriver family, she had a brother, Bobby Shriver, who was a writer for a newspaper in Los Angeles called the um, Herald Examiner. And it was a, a, a William Randolph Hearst owned newspaper. Well, Arnold says, hey, Bobby, write these articles about, um, you know, bad things about Gold's Gym, which Bobby Shriver did. He's, um, you know, um, you know, uh, what's going on at Gold's Gym, and and just it was a lot of uh, innuendo. And if you're a, an American citizen and you have some interest in journalism, you realize that some the 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 birth or not the birth, but at least definitely one of the champions of yellow journalism was William Randolph Hearst and the Hearst newspapers. That was always what they did. Um, so again. Uh, that's when, you know, Ken Sprague said, enough is enough. Um, you know, I'm not only going to sue Arnold, but I'm going to sue his employers, who at the time were Gulf Western, which owned Paramount Studios, because they were the ones investing in Arnold's movie career. So um, um, another thing that Arnold was doing at that time, because Ken was promoting the 1977 AAU Mr. America, was... Um, trying to get all the bad press in Golds to try and, again, like Ken said, pull the, pull the legs out from under the, uh, the contest. So it was, um, you know, it was, it was a battle. I mean, th there was a court, there was a court battle and Joe Weider testified on behalf of Ken Sprague because, um, you know, he, uh, Arnold was also at that time, um, trying to leverage another magazine called Muscle Digest against Muscle Builder. Um, you know, so that's the thing. It's like people don't realize at one point that Arnold and Joe were on opposite sides of the fence until the contract was signed and until the lawsuit. Um, Arnold wouldn't have won that lawsuit. Um, you just, I mean, I think, uh, um, anyway, I'm getting off point. We can edit this. I'm sorry. But uh, um, hmm. yeah, it's interesting. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's a whole other story into itself. But um, was there a Ken Sprague, Arnold and Franco related video that Arnold also didn't want to get out was was that another thing or? yeah well you know and that's the thing that I think that one I think that's what was part of what started the bad blood is um um you know Ken you know with with uh, one of those films had with he goes it was he goes one it was my bad I shouldn't have done it um he interspersed uh, I think Arnold and Franco training in amidst uh a, a, a gay film right and um and rightfully it pissed them off right so um i think that's when and, and it's funny because ken said that arnold went to joe weeder and said tell ken to knock it off and joe was like why can't you guys settle it yourself and he said so ken and arnold were in joe weeder's office and ken's like yeah it was bad you know my fault you know, whatever was settled for, he goes probably less than 300 bucks in 1974 dollars or whatever. Um, uh, you know, yeah, you're right. I think Randy mentioned it was 50 bucks. Yeah, probably <laughs> that. Yeah. If even, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so, um, but I, again, you know, um, Arnold doesn't like to lose, right. He, uh, or, you know, if you burn him, then he's gonna, he's gonna, and I think that's where he's like, okay, if this is how you're going to play, uh, and, uh, from that point on, um, uh, you know, I think that's, I think that's why there was that animus towards Golds and Ken, um, when he had a bigger microphone in his hand, so to speak, with the, his success after pumping iron. The guy from the next street, he was always really big and he had won a Mr. Rochester contest. And I said, how do you get like that? He saw oh, just, you got to train a lot, you know, and eat a lot of protein. You know, he says, I eat steak and I drink a lot of milk. And that was it, you know, I mean, so a friend of mine had a bakery and we started making our own protein out of powdered egg whites and powdered casein. Started taking that and I noticed I started putting on a little more size. I, I started to develop very, very fast. That following year, I won the contest in 68. So within that short period of time, I learned what bodybuilding was, what kind of routine to follow 
how to train, basically. So 1969, I went to the Junior Mr. America contest, and I placed second to last. And I was 192 pounds. These guys were huge. Ken Waller won it. He won that contest. It was the Junior Mr. USA. I couldn't understand how these guys were putting on all this muscle. They didn't tell me that they were using any kind of anabolic activity. I asked Ken, I said, Ken, how do you get like this? He goes, got to research some, you know, some chemistry. So I went back and I did. I researched chemistry with my uncle who was a doctor in Chicago. And then he sent me a cargo container this big of Anabar. One of the more interesting and iconic linchpins of Golds was Pete Rumkowski. And his story in your film, I think, was one of the highlights to me. It just appeared, it just seemed so crazy and so unbelievable. And recently I did a video about the dosages that he said, uh, or he well quoted, yeah. uh, that were, he used during his competitive days. Was Pete simply trolling everybody, or were these legit stories, legit dosages? What, is there anything that we need to know about that at all? You know, it, it's, it's, I would, it's, Pete's a storyteller, but I would tend to believe the dosages only because um, bodybuilding's changed so much and guys are on year round. And Pete would get ready for one contest a year and go all out. And then, you know, Four or five months later, if he didn't have posing exhibitions lined up or whatnot, Pete would weigh like 190 pounds. You know, he'd look like an athletically built guy, but not like a huge bodybuilder. And then like within two months, you'd see this 240 pound, you know, monster. Um, and his his um, his uncle was was a medical doctor who was able to supply him with with um, whatever he needed. And one thing about Pete is, you know, he's um, a self-educated guy. And I think, you know, he was Dan Duchesne before Dan Duchesne. You know, he could, he would, one, because he had access, his, his, his uncle would give him all the, all the medical journals. And, and, and Pete was a guy who was explaining hormone cascades in the 1970s. And guys don't care about that. They just want to get big. But he did the plumbing underneath you know, uh, you know, all the science behind it, you know, so um, I, I would say he would say, yeah, I, I would believe the, the dosages only because he would only do it for probably three months and then lay off, you know, for the rest of the year. I mean, you saw him after he retired and it's like, I mean, you know, he's like a 180 pound guy, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's pretty different. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Franco was another guy that he was never really that verbal and he always seemed content just to live in Arnold's shadow. So it was really a good window into Franco via your documentary, because for the first time we heard Franco speak quite a lot of dialogue for once. Um, let's just watch this outtake okay. first and then we'll get into the questions. All righty. Charles Gaines was only interested in making the movie and hoping that the book sells more. And George Butler was more interested in making the best movie. Now what happened was on the cover was Ed Corney. And George Butler, I heard him talking in South Africa. He wanted Ed Corney to beat me. And Charles Gaines said, I don't care. He says, Franco is the best. You know, he's going to win anyway. Uh, like I was saying, like Franco seemed to be the counterpoint of Arnold in so many ways. But can you tell us a little bit more about Franco that maybe a lot of us don't know from the golden era or what you learned from Franco with, you know, the interviews that you conducted with him? Uh, yeah, you know, um, Franco, he was a very, very sweet, generous man. Um, and I, I, I want to say that by nature, um, you know, he, he's kind of like pulled along Arnold's jet stream and he knew it was beneficial to him. Um, but at the same time, I think it put him in uncomfortable positions. I just kind of have a feeling because naturally he's a sweet person and I think an introvert. And so, and with Arnold being the total opposite of that um if franco's gonna ride that dragon so to speak he's gonna be in battles that he normally wouldn't be in and i think he kind of found himself there in, in a few things and and probably um I, I mean i could mention one story post 1981 olympia that i witnessed at world gym in it was 81 
and it was Danny Padilla. And Danny, who was from Rochester, New York, was um, speaking to another Rochester native, a guy who trained with me from time to time named Joe Fuster. And um, uh, Danny and Joe were working out and Franco walks up and this is post 81 Olympia, like months after. And you know what happened. And I mean, people are beyond pissed off still. And, you know, Danny turned to Franco, you know, and then Franco smiles and says, Hey, Danny, how are you? And Franco and uh, Danny says, Hey, Franco, are you here to like uh, write a book? You're here to tell us how you won. You're here to tell us how to build. So, I mean, he just like, um, you know, kind of really laid into him, but kind of in a humorous New York type of way. And you could tell that Franco was uncomfortable. You know, he, he, was, he wasn't banking on that confrontation. And I think, I think part of, you know, Franco's bravado after the 80 Olympia, when people said, you know, when, you know, cause people were pissed off that Arnold won. Um, and then Franco said, well, maybe I'll come back and win the next year. Um, you know, and when you get pulled into that, this was the backside of, of the false bravado, you know, um, you know, so, uh, but I mean, personally, one-to-one, you know, Franco, I, I think, you know, just a very sweet person, you know, I mean, just very generous with his time. And uh, yeah, I always kind of felt like he, it was, it was like a role he had to play, you know, um, the Sardinian strong man and, and, uh, you know, um, whatever else Joe Weider build him as. Um, I mean, he's very proud of his athletic accomplishments or whatnot and his strength because he was really strong. But I kind of think that I think he almost had more like a Dave Draper personality and he just wanted to to be just quiet, you know, left alone. Because you also seem to have a really good or very confident guy as well, because remember in Public Iron, he said that I think that I'm better than Arnold and I think I have every right to win this Olympia in yeah, he always seemed to, he had a little bit of an ego on him as well, it seemed, but uh, yeah, it was just always hidden in Arnold's shadow. So it was kind of a, yeah. a little bit of an enigma. Yeah, that, that's yeah. true. Actually, when you say that, it, it, it yeah, you remind me of, of him saying that. Of course, I feel I could win, but they're, they usually choose the taller guy. And I'm, I'm sure, I mean, yeah. um, and one, Franco did have, you know, it's weird. It's like guys that were built like Franco, um, you know, they're, they're like dense, you know, all the time, their, their muscle density is just like rock hard. And then when they pose, um, not not as much happens as when someone like Arnold poses or someone like Cal Scalac or someone that has what they call the explosion, you know, and while, while Arnold standing relaxed didn't have the density of Franco, uh, when he posed or Cal posed, it's almost like, you know, they just, they, they it was dramatic, right? It was like this dramatic thing. and. Um, you know, Franco's arm was like, you know, 19 inches hanging. And when he flexed it, it was like maybe 19 and a quarter. And it's still impressive, but you don't see that, uh, that thing. But you're right. I mean, he was, you know, incredibly muscular and incredibly strong and, and, and definitely very confident. So I call it the flex wheeler effect, you know, just standing there, he may be, you know, 213 pounds, but then when he poses, it just, it all comes alive. You, you know, that's, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, Serge, was, Serge Newbray was another guy that I think wasn't really fairly portrayed in Pumping Iron because he lacked that backstory. He just seemed like an 11th hour entrant, entrant and they didn't really give, you know, any uh, story behind him. But, you know, he was marginalised by the IFBB and he was kind of, they, they were very punitive against him, I think. And this outtake that you provide here I thought was excellent. The whole thing with, with Gold's Gym was that counter. You know that everything, uh, that, that whole gym, when we were on 2nd Street especially, that gym was big. It went from the one side all the way to the alley. But the counter, everything was around the counter. I remember the day when a, a Serge Nubre came in during the 1977 and Mr. America, he walked in with his wife Jacqueline. And I never forget it, you know, he was, he was brilliant and he was big and he had this white towel type t-shirt with a big crucifix and the gym stopped. <laughs> This is something I've never shared with anyone. But the gym stopped because I was at the front counter and the gym stopped. And even Robbie Robinson, who would never let anything stop his training, I looked over and Robbie Robinson froze as Serge Nubre walked into the gym. It was amazing. 
Oh yeah, when he when he came to Golds in '77, and um, there's some wonderful photos um, from Sports Illustrated in '74, uh, pre Olympia in '74, where he's sitting on a bench next to Arnold. You've probably seen those photos. Um, you know, so he would always make the trek out to California, um, but in 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 he was kind of larger than life. Uh, you know, Serge Nubre, because one, he was, he was always in Europe. So when he came to America um, and people are actually seeing the guy from the magazine and I, I you know, the, I look at photos today of Serge Nubre and I'm still blown away, um, you know, because he had just such a, a, a fantastic dramatic physique. Um, and as far as from, from what I've heard, uh, if you've seen photos of Serge in 74 and wasn't he at the last minute barred from competing in 74 as well for the Olympia. And he looked pretty darn good. Uh, yeah, 70, 75, I think. Um, I'm not sure about 74, but that was when the whole political wrangling between him and Ben Weider came up and he was kicked out of the IFBB right. because of the whole gay porn film debacle. I mean, it wasn't really anything and then they about let him that. Back and in. yeah, and then he didn't train for ten weeks. They let him back in at the last minute. <laughs> yeah, and 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 he actually he actually that was a funny thing is he actually beat Ben Weider when they elected for president of the IFBB, and he beat Ben. And then all of a sudden they said, "Oh no no no, we're going to suspend him." And then that's when Ben appointed himself president for life, <laughs> basically, right? And um, from what I heard, um, they they were. I think I think Serge wanted money as well. Since Arnold was being paid, he's like, if I'm going to be, I've done film work and legitimate film work, and if Arnold's being paid, I want to be paid. Even if I'm not paid as much, I want to be paid. Well, um, also he looked pretty fantastic in '75, and and then he gets suspended, and so I. Here's my feeling, and from what's been mentioned, and I'm not going to mention who said it. Um, I'm not going to say who said it, but they were fearful that he was going to beat Arnold. He looked that good. So I think that's why he got jerked around in 75. Like, no, you can't compete. You're suspended. And then they're like, you know what? Five weeks to go. Oh, you know what? You can compete. And at that point, he's like, well, to get the ball rolling again. And I think that's why his legs look so weak in 75 um even though his upper body still looks tremendous um but um yeah he i think he really got marginal marginalized there um uh but yeah i mean in my outtake when when pete samara mentions to me that that even robbie stopped i think it shows you uh surge's impact you know because he was even to like guys within the industry that were top level competitors like Robbie Robinson, when they saw Serge Nubre in person, even they had to do a double take. I mean, he was, he was that level of, of uh, um, competitor and mythic. One guy that sidelined himself was Frank Zane. And he always seemed a little bit bitter after pumping iron that he didn't get to take part. I don't know if he was regretful about that, but uh, here's another clip about Frank Zane from Charles Gaines. Frank Zane was one of the most interesting characters who worked out in uh, Golds at that point, and one of the smartest, very spiritual, ahead of his time. He and Christine had a wonderful wife uh, named Christine Zane, um, and uh, they practiced much earlier than anybody else that I knew, um, super healthy, macrobiotic diet, but they were both very, uh, very thoughtful, spiritual people. He was a very um, different cut than most of the bodybuilders who hung out there. He was very focused and very serious. Um, he also, to my mind, had one of the most uh, aesthetically pleasing male bodybuilder bodies of all time. I mean, in terms of just pure symmetry um, and the proportion of all the parts to the whole, you, nobody could beat Frank. Charles was sort of saying that Frank came across a little bit serious, and I think maybe that wasn't the vibe they were going for in the documentary because Pumping Iron, when they presented Arnold, it made it look fun, it made it look 
exciting and something that you wanted to do by the beach. Frank, maybe it was a little bit too overly serious for that, that appeal. Did you reach out to Frank at all to participate in Dream Big? I, I did. I, I, I fired off um, a few emails and also um, had other guys um, try and reach out to Frank on, on my behalf. And um, yeah, no, no luck. Um, which, which, you know, it would have been great because he could have had his say. And if if you you know you've seen the outtakes and and even even in the final cut of Pumping Iron, you can see Frank in the background. He's there at gold when I think Arnold's doing the concentration curls, and you see Frank walking along the dumbbell rack. But I guess he worked out at Vince's for that time, um, for most of it. Um, but yeah, Frank is like he could see it shaping up as basically an Arnold based film and he's like if it's about all of us and it should be about all of us which i could understand but at the same time um he's one he was a top level competitor and he's really intelligent and and uh and he would have i'm sure he would have had you know a portion in pumping iron to give his say i think he i mean he i think he would have been uh a great addition to it uh and my film as well so no luck so <laughs> unfortunately yeah yeah Dream Bigs was one of like the last films to capture a lot of the great bodybuilders before some of them passed. You know, we've since lost Doug Brignoli, Franco, Rick Drayson, and even recently like Lisa Lyon. You featured Lisa in the film and you have an outtake about her from Tony Pearson. Let's watch that clip first. Well, Lisa Lyon was the first woman bodybuilder. Most of us bodybuilders, we didn't realize what the impact of the sport would become. She was cute. She wasn't overly developed. She was in good shape. If they depicted grace and beauty, it was good because there was a stigma attached to bodybuilding that, you know, we were different. But when women started lifting weights and when Kenny opened up the Second Street Gym to women, I think that was the greatest move because if you look at bodybuilding today, I think the impact of Lisa Line was the beginning of one of the greatest moves because when women got involved in bodybuilding it opened it up so she was really the start she was like somebody that started the first car like Ford when he developed the first car Lisa Lyon was that to bodybuilding. Lisa Lyon was about five foot three five four weighed about a hundred and five pounds you know but she could deadlift like 225 which is very strong that's a little lady. Ken Sprakes asked me to guest post with her at the 1979 Mr. Los Angeles. And I refused. I said, no, I'm not going to post her. Because I, no one had seen someone, a female, flexing the biceps before, actually flexing the muscles. And I said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do it. He says, come on, you got to do it. I said, okay, I agree. So Lisa, she's an artist. So she hired this guy to blow a saxophone live. And we had two spotlights. I go, I don't know, what, what's the mixed pairs? What is that? What do you do together? So she says, you just follow me. I'm going to put the routine together. So this is the first time I did mixed pairs. I didn't even know later on in life I was going to be doing that. So she did the routine. And in the middle of the routine, I'm asking myself, why am I doing this? Because you couldn't hear a pin drop. The place was packed, standing room only. This is a disaster because typically you hit a pose, the crowd goes crazy. You hit another pose, they go even more crazy. There was nothing. It was silence. We finished the routine. We got a standing ovation. It was pandemonium. It was insane. That was the beginning of women bodybuilding. She was the first professional female bodybuilder. And she won a show that she promoted a couple of shows. And uh, I think the following year, 1980, the first Miss Olympia came along. So I think somebody got an idea from that stage, from that moment. Female bodybuilding, Rachel McLish, 1980 Miss Olympia. But I had something to do with that. <laughs> she really was set up as the pioneer for female bodybuilding. But after winning that first competition in 79, she never competed again. As Tony stated, the crowd loves seeing her and she may have even inspired the first Miss Olympia. So do you have any idea why she retired so early? Because I haven't heard the backstory about that. You know, I, th I think Lisa, um, 
and bodybuilding was was always a vehicle for her and um what many people don't know is she um she was training at another gym in in santa monica uh kind of on the border of santa monica and brentwood for um for her strength training for um kendo the the japanese art of, of um, stick fighting so um when she came to golds um you know you could tell she had a physique i mean obviously um you know by today's standards um uh, you know, not very muscular, but back then, even then, you know, you could see she had separation of the delts and, and, uh, she had fantastic hamstrings and quads. Um, but I think for her, it was always, it was always a vehicle, you know, um, it was, it was, I think she saw, um, because it was a burgeoning thing. She's like, I can see this as a promotional vehicle for me. Um, she came, her father was a very prominent orthodontist in Los Angeles. He was basically known as the, uh, uh, the smile maker for the stars kids. So that was his clientele, Lisa, um, uh, very well educated. Um, she graduated from UCLA. Um, the things that she was exposed to in her life raising, you know, from people that come from, from that economic strata is from a totally different world from most typical gym rats. They don't even know that world exists as far as like, you know, uh, you know, ha you know, having French lessons or, or, uh, you know, going abroad for vacations or whatnot. Um, she was a script, um, a script consultant and read scripts for studios in, in, in Los Angeles for, um, for the movie industry. So I, I for her, it's like, uh, this is a hobby for me. This is something I can do and I could use it to vault myself because I think from there, um, she formed a partnership with uh, Robert Mapplethorpe, the uh, the famous photographer, and then and then you know got some some books out of that, and then went from there to marrying a rock star in France, and uh, you know it was for her it wasn't like it wasn't like someone who was going to be defending the Miss Olympia title for five times. She was like it was like one and done. I'm gone. Um, so I don't think I mean she was she was an um, an athletic person. Um, and she hoisted weight before before she ever got to goals. But I don't think bodybuilding was ever um, anything more than what she was going to use as a way to catapult herself um, to to something to something else. Hey, so, interesting. Yeah, the ma the Maple Thorpe uh, photos were quite interesting. Yes. We'll, yeah. We'll let, yeah. Uh, we'll let those quite interesting. <laughs> find those ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, before we go, I just wanted to mention that I saw a recent article from physical culture historian Connor Heffernan. He runs the physical culture blog, who also reviewed your movie. And he yes. said about the film recently that the real story and the history behind the film was even more fascinating than what Pumping Iron portrayed. And I sort of thought I could not have said it better myself, but what a fantastic compliment. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing you might have read his thoughts on your movie as well. And oh yeah, God bless Connor and and you. I mean, he was. Um, um, we've communicated uh, via, I want to say, Iron History website and private messages, and he had mentioned that that um, you know he would like to watch the movie and review it, and um, you know, and he was, you know. As you know, he's a, he's a professor in in, um, a PhD in Ireland. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so I was I was uh, you know, you know, honored for him to to give such a, a good write up, and you know, like like you, the insight, you know, because I think for a lot of us, it's not so much. I mean, the sport's interesting, but it's not so much that. It's it's the the motivations behind um, why people do what they do. Um, and the world they lived in every day that to me is just, you know, the, the interesting story. So, yeah, um, I was, I was, you know, over, over the moon by, by Connor's words, I have to say. And I can only imagine what like a massive undertaking this whole project would have been for you. It's almost like kind of birthing a child. Every time even I release a video, I kind of, there's like a little dopamine surge and I sort of think, oh, I'm happy about yeah. that, regardless of how it falls in the uh, popularity of, 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 you know, of how it lands. But um, what are you most proud of in regards to releasing the film Dream Big? Uh, you know, one, um, 
I'm proud that I finished. Uh, you know, that's a, um, and Charles Gaines had told me, you know, um, he goes, if you finish, you win. And, um, you know, it was a journey over several years and I had to remind myself, um, because I met so many people along the way and, uh, depending on where, um, you meet them on the road and some of the ones towards the end of the road that I would meet or speak to, you know, and they're like, Oh, well, you know, um, they were thinking it in like monetary terms, you know, like, you know, um, you know, who do you think could pick up this movie or, you know, do you think it could get the Netflix or how much do you think it can make or whatever? And, and it made me realize that when I started even thinking about making this movie, making even a penny off, it wasn't even, you know, a concern of mine. Um, it was just to tell the story, you know, a story that, that, that I was at. And then for me, one, you know, like I mentioned to you on several occasions to, to set the history straight, you know, history that's been changed um, or mistold for various reasons. So I'm like, Oh, I want to lay this down. And um, also I'm proud that I finished, but also not just for myself, but for the guys they gave of their time, you know, and, and now, um, you know, I mean, it was uh, just last month, October, I, you know, I was, I was uh, trading messages with Herman Brignoli, Doug's brother, you know, it's like, wow, it's been a year since, since my brother passed. And, um, you know, for Rick now, it's been a few years and Franco as well. And, um, uh, you know, so, but their testimony is going to live on, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm proud of that because, uh, you know, whatever people think of, of bodybuilding or, or California at that point in time, um, it's kind of a historical, a historical document, you know, a pop culture document, you know, so I'm kind of proud that it's, you know, like you, when you, we create anything, you know, it's, it's going to live on and, um, our intentions are pure, um, then it's a success. Yeah. I think it's a tremendous honor of what you also did with those guys. You immortalize your sto their stories, like you said. Uh, it was well received by so many people. You did a real service to the, those of us who are really interested in that era and history of bodybuilding in general. Because when we all pick up a when we pick up a weight, we are really connecting with all those people and their stories from the past. That's why it really resonates with me. Um, I'm just wondering what's next for Mark Martinez. Uh, do you have any more projects that are coming down the line? You, you know, I, I I I wish it's 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 um I was gonna. I, I was really excited about doing something. I think we spoke about this before, or emailed back and forth on it about uh, doing something about a radio station in Los Angeles, which um, was a renegade station in the middle seventies that um, um, was like the little engine that could. Uh, and eventually by the early eighties had become the template for um, album oriented rock and roll in the United States. And then, and then, kind of around the world after that. And it was called, uh, the station was KROQ, K-Rock. Um, and I contacted the original programmer. He was a gentleman, he's a gentleman named uh, Shadow Stevens. He was just recently inducted into the Radio Broadcasters Hall of Fame in New York. Um, people in the States know Shadow Stevens, even if they don't know his face, they know his voice. And um, we had spoken earnestly about it. And I told him about it. He said, let's talk. Uh, we set up a talk and he says, you know, I have to tell you that I had a couple guys that were interviewing me about five years ago and I spoke to them for like two hours. We got it on, um, you know, they shot the video. He goes, I haven't heard anything back. I don't know if that documentary is ever going to come out. And my first thought was stupid me. Why, why did I think I was the only guy that was going to think about a K-Rock documentary? And then he told me, yeah, you know, um, uh, Adam Carollo, who is, um, he was involved with Jimmy Kimmel on the man show, which was a program in the United States. And then he's also a pretty famous podcaster here. I don't know what his reach is overseas. Yeah, and then Jimmy Kimmel with the Jimmy yeah. Kimmel show. Yeah. So I thought, well, you know what, shadow I go with their connections and money, it's going to get finished. And sure enough, I think they're close to completing it now. So that kind of like stole my thunder. And I told them, I said, I go, this is going to sound very fat headed of me. And I said, I, um, if I could have secured the funding, I'm positive I could have done a better job only in the sense that um, 
I mean, they had access to U2 and all these rock groups that were, you know, once, once you've got the money, then you can get people. Um, but I had said, I said, um, one, I was growing up in Southern California as a kid glued to the radio, listening to you and listening to the station that you built as your original program director. And I go and I, so I know the DNA of the station. I know the tenor in the times. And I told him, I said, I draw a corollary between K rock, and golds in the 70s versus k-rock and golds in the 80s because in the 80s most of the world found out about golds gym and in the 80s a lot of people in the united states found out about k-rock i said but in the 70s that's when all the backbreaking, um you know uh sewing and seeding was done you know um the hard work was done by by ken sprague building golds um by you being the program director of K-Rock and going without paychecks for three or four months so that your DJs could get paid and keep you guys on the air. And I said, and I see a corollary because both of those concerns exploded in the 80s. And a lot of people that take the low hanging fruit of that story don't know what went on in the 70s. So um, I kind of, I'm still trying to think of somehow I could, I could pull it off, but I don't know. Um, I was going to do one on Steve Mihalik. Steve Mihalik yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, have you spoken with Brian Moss? Who's no, um, not yet. No, I heard an interview with him okay. with uh, John. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, Brian called me. Uh, we were speaking this evening, and um, um, you know, because he had asked me about the Mihalik one, and I said, you know, um, I spoke with Steve Junior on several occasions. We had really great conversations and I was really excited. I had gotten some bodybuilders that had trained under Steve or at Steve's gym um, from that era, from the 70s into the 80s, like um, Tom Terwilliger and Joey Folco and and uh, John Defendus. And um, and I was really, really excited. And, and Steve, Steve Jr. said, well, let me let me talk to my mom. Um, and I understand it's a family thing. And I I. I I said, I'm not going to take cheap shots. Um, you know, I'm not going to say he was a saint, but I'm also not going to, you know, drag your dad through the mud. We'll do something fair. Um, and then he never got back to me. And then I had my my uh, my friend in New York, who's a lawyer, contact him several times. I, you know, hey, are there any concerns? We want to let you know that this is, a you know, totally above board. And it kind of stalled there. So, uh, and I have to respect that. If the family doesn't want to participate, or if one of the family, then I'm I'm not gonna, you know, do anything unauthorized. So, and beyond that, I'm trying to think of something to hitch on to. Maybe I can edit Brian's Brian's work. <laughs> you know, so yeah, Brian's an interesting character. That's, but like you said, I think that's the tragedy of the golden era content that's having such a huge resurgence and is so popular. But the ultimate tragedy is, is they're not making any more of it. So the more golden era content that gets pumped out, but by channels like mine or, you know, people that are just interested in that, we paint ourselves into a corner content wise, because there's only yeah. so much film. There's only so many pictures. There's only so many stories. And where do we right. go from there? You know, this, right, this, exactly. this new era is not interesting enough almost to document that no, that, no, recent, yeah. that recent Olympia was not only a shit show, but a tragedy. And I think just has dug the hole deeper for bodybuilding as we once loved yeah. and remembered it. And I mean, I hate to kind of always shit on the, the new generation, but yeah. they don't do themselves any favors, nor do the people running the no. show. So no, yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> God, yeah. I was speaking with a, a personal trainer, uh, close to the town where I live and he was mentioning the Olympia and I, I hadn't read anything about it. So I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> and then I read, I read and I'm just like, you know, and I had said something to Charles Gaines, you know, a couple of years back where I, I said, you know, bodybuilding always seems to shoot itself in the foot. And, and he laughed and I asked him, I said, because you're basically, the guy that brought this to the rest of the to the rest of the world outside of the bodybuilding world and i said at one time uh, you know bodybuilding was at the cusp of i mean 
it may have never been a mainstream sport, but it would have enjoyed, you know, some more validity and not be made fun of. And I said, um, were you surprised that bodybuilding kind of destroyed itself? And he says, no. He goes, I was surprised at how fast they did it, though. <laughs> you know, so I think it's kind of been something that it's weird because if you're like a hardcore guy, um, I guess it depends on what era you're from, because, you know, working out at Golds and working out at World in the time that I did, there were still guys from like the golden age of Muscle Beach that were there. You know, it's like I got to speak to Seymour Koenig and Artie Zeller and Zabo Kazuski, and they were like, ah, you know, Arnold, he's too big, you know, and I'm just like, what do you mean? That's like awesome, you know, and um, but then it's funny because like, a few years after that, you know, you're starting to see guys like Dorian Yates. I'm like, yeah, they're getting a little too big for me. Like I'm just, you know, and now, and, and now Dorian probably looks tiny compared to the guys waddling on stage now. He definitely looks a lot yeah. more aesthetic. You know, when I look at Dorian's say 93, I sort of think, wow, he looks very yeah. tight and the waist is good and the everything Fantastic. was flowing. And yeah. And then I kind of, after that, it, he lost, you know, it a little bit, but these days it's just a tragedy to the eyes they better hope that bumstead yeah. you know stays in another five to ten years if they're going to have any kind of semblance of appeal you know to the new generation of kids coming up but, right right a absolutely yeah guy looks great doesn't he it's fantastic physique but you know um, i yeah, still as take, far as like the open yeah. i'd still take a bob paris over bumstead any day oh oh yeah so it so would i yeah, yeah without a doubt so bob yeah. was born in the wrong era plenty big Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> we don't want to get black pill oh. about uh, the direction of body. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. That could, be its own, that could be its own podcast, but um, maybe you could join us sometime with Randy, because I think that John Little is working on a 1980s Mr. Olympia documentary, and he's just written that book oh. about Bruce Lee. So I wanted to speak with him about the book about Bruce Lee with Randy. And then maybe, you know, because you, had a lot of input to that 1980s side of thing with the Olympia with Randy's yeah. last book. So maybe you could join yeah. us for a uh, nice little. I, I would love to. Is he doing it on the 1980s specifically? Yeah, apparently. Or yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, I wonder. Apparently, he's dug up a lot of new information from Randy, what Randy told me. So. Wow. Should be interesting. Wow. Because the film, the, un, the unedited, the, the, well, yeah. I, I'm trying to think 1980s because it was CBS sports spectacular that was going to televise it that year. It wasn't ABC's wild of sports. And um, one of the people I used to work with in Los Angeles, she went to work for CBS and she uh, became like uh, a West coast operations executive. And I remember asking her like um, a few years back, um, do you happen to know, CBS Sports Spectacular, 1980, where that stuff would live. And she's like, yeah. she has Mark. Um, sadly, um, you know, especially like marginal fringe sports, you know, and bodybuilding was certainly one of them. Um, she goes, if it was shot on video, it was probably bulk erased. And the tapes were used again, um, especially after what happened there. But um if John somehow secured the film, because sure, Megan, who was the producer and called those guys to New York to talk about, can you explain this shit show? Because <laughs> this looks like a fix. It doesn't even look like, you know, you know, we're here to, to film sports and this looks like a joke. Um, yeah, please. Explain. But if he somehow, yeah, got a hold of that film, kudos to him because, uh, um, you know, you'd hear the booze, you know, you'd hear the chants. Um, you know, um, wow, I, I'd be excited. Um, yeah, well, I'll to, talk to them to, about to it and we can see what we can, uh, tee up because that'd be an interesting conversation, I think as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, most of these videos probably, uh, exist on the Arnold's boot heel, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Desmond, Desmond Butler, George's son had, um, um, it's, it has to be going on close to two years now. And he had emailed me one time um, and uh, he had said, 
his, you know, his, George, his father had passed and he says, we're, we're going through the stuff at the house in New Hampshire. He was back at his parents' house. And he said, I found a lot of stuff in the basement. He goes, a lot of stuff from, from George and Charles from when they first met Arnold wow. in 72. He goes, we have, well, we've talked about it, cassette recordings, um, some film, um, some photos and whatnot. And, and, um, and I'm just like, darn, you know, <laughs> um, who knows what's on those, on those cassette tapes, you know, what's yeah, been said. Amazing. But, um, it's good yeah. that Desmond's rattling a few cages as well with his articles with the IFBB and the. Yeah. Um, what's the latest on that? I mean, I know it seems to like, has Jim Mannion weathered the storm on this? Don't they always, those guys are Teflon coated, it seems, you know. Yeah, and but I would think off. just, it's like, yeah, we're we're not. We're, yeah, I mean, what do they, what do they do? Because it's like it's basically a women's rights issue. I mean, it's 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 sexual predator. It's this classic is, this is me outside. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like that's that goes beyond this. This is like absolute law. So unless someone got paid off, but um, yeah, I'm surprised that, that Desmond um, took that on uh, only because he writes for the Washington Post. But I do do know that Wayne Demelia was close friends with George and, and, and knew Desmond. So um, I'm sure there was a connection there, but yeah. Um, and yet I'm sure part of what happened at the Olympia is a lot of the same kind of crowd, right. In terms of just kind of like shooting yourself in the foot with the show. I don't know. Yeah. It's just so boring that, yeah, I don't even, <laughs> I didn't want to cover it for my own channel, let alone speak to yeah. it uh yeah i've just lost interest in it. it doesn't doesn't kind of appeal to me anymore so you know you were talking about the olympia and um you know it's jumped the shark so long ago but you could you know you could look at a guy even maybe up i mean definitely like a bob paris or, or a lee haney or sean ray or or you know the late 70s early 80s guys and even though they were way more muscular than probably most men wanted to be um, there was still an element to where someone could imagine some people would want to look like that, but then mm. there were other people that, that could imagine those guys doing something else. Like, oh, I could imagine maybe Arnold might have been a good interior lineman in the NFL, or you know, Bob Paris definitely could have played linebacker like he did in, in Indiana at Indiana State, um, or Frank Zane looks like an athlete. But then when you look at like the GH gut guys that that waddle around, it's like even people look and go, well, what purpose do they serve other than that? Like, there's no way they could tie their shoes or run more than 30 yards without stopping. So, you know, it just, it just seems so pointless. You know, it's just so ridiculous to me. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't get the appeal. I think the appeal of the golden era guys, like you said, number one, there was a resonance with their stories. The people who used to ghostwrite their articles could write the characters very well. And right. secondly, like you said, they were aspirational in a way. At the back of your mind, you sort of thought that if you worked as hard, you could at least look like Frank Zane or whoever, right. whoever appealed to you. Right. And yeah, that there was some functionality or crossover to what they did to other things. They did look like superheroes, whereas the ones yeah. these days have transgressed even the superhero appeal. That <laughs> I know. Yeah. So. And, and another thing too, as you know, you know, um, you know, I see your pictures on Instagram and, and your muscularity still what's, what's, what's funny is these quote unquote top level guys, they don't look like they have muscle density. They look like they're filled with oil or water. It's like, do they really work out that hard? It's like they take, they eat a ton of food to get big. And I know that they take those drugs. I mean, Wayne D'Amelia has sent me in Ken Spray emails where he says, they go to uh, where do they go qatar or they go somewhere in the middle east yeah, right where, that, where they yeah. have it yeah and they just yeah they just sit and eat and have that drug and it's like you know if you guys actually worked out um probably a bit more and stopped focusing on the chemical side you'd actually look like you earned that i mean it, it doesn't even look at sometimes like real muscle it just it just doesn't even when they flex you don't seem to see the striations like you did um, you know, it's just, yeah. Go and check anyway. out the, uh, go and check out the recent contests picks of the Olympia 
with Hardy and Derek and the sight injections all over the lats sticking out like oh bulbous. yeah. Oh, it's yeah. so off-putting. It's just <laughs> embarrassing to be associated with it. I think anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. That's the weird thing is, and I mentioned this to John Hansen one time. I said, I don't know how, you know, when you have the same people involved in, um, in whatever endeavor it is, they they bring their knowledge and their love of a certain aesthetic along with them, right? Like if it's a film critic you know, who is reviewing films in the 1960s or 70s, they will still have an appreciation for story, narrative, cinematography, editing, whether it's 2020 or whatever, like it was 50, 60 years ago. So when you have the same people or some of the same people or a few of the same people who actually saw the lighting of a top level contest, like in the 70s with a, a black backdrop and dramatic overhead lighting, and a, a quality posing routine. How do you guys let it slip to the stark lighting, smother with ads in the background, and a guy just hitting most muscular shots and then waddling off stage? Like, how did you let it get to that? If you knew what it was, how did you not like say, no, that's not going to fly, you know, or one, let's, let's one present a nice show first off. And then in terms of our presentation, these are the guidelines. I just don't understand how they like one day said, oh, yeah, that doesn't matter anymore. Oh, you, don't, you don't even have to have calves anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, come on stage in socks then. I mean, if it doesn't matter, right? I, 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 don't, I don't understand that. I like men's physique, but even they're huge these days. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> See, it'd be great to do one with Randy if he's up for it. I'm definitely up for it. I'll, I'll tee it up because I'm just finishing the book now with John Little with about Bruce Lee. It's a really uh -huh. well written book. It's about can Bruce yeah. Lee really fight? And it goes into all of his street fights that he had that were off the record. And, you know, he right. really dug up some archival history with this one. So it, it's appealing wow. to me. I, I'm really enjoying and, it. And is it. Isn't John, um, isn't he an instructor? Isn't he a professor as well? Or am I misinformed on that? Uh, he's definitely I'm involved. Thinking. Yeah, he made a documentary about Bruce Lee. Obviously, he's written lots of books and he's on the, you know, a bit of a guru on the Mensa to topic as well. But yeah, I think I'm not 100% sure to speak to that. But yeah, he's, he's okay. definitely done his homework. <laughs> but I have been really grateful for our conversation today. And. I want to just Me encourage too. everybody again, go and check the film out again. You will see it through different eyes. And having checked out the deleted scenes now featured in this podcast, it will give you a new appreciation for the material yet again. And, of course, if you haven't checked it out, you need to get straight on it because you're missing a rare, real treat in bodybuilding as it pertains to any information that's coming out about the golden era. So do yourself a favor. Thanks again, Mark, for agreeing to chat with me oh so th thank you I, I i tru truly appreciate it i really do thanks um so thank you <laughs> yeah yeah thank you again thanks again